let's see. Well, it is time. Uh, let's see. Um, give me another moment. Okay, let me get the, the streaming set up. Apologize, give me another moment and I'll get us going. Okay. Ready. Okay. All right. Well, um, apologize for uh, our short delay. Appreciate you guys jumping in. And uh, I know that uh, as more people are joining, uh, if we hit the uh, uh, max on Zoom, uh, there'll be a redirect to uh, uh, hopefully LinkedIn Live or, or YouTube Live. And so that's kind of the way we set up. But for those of you who are here uh, and uh, are with us, appreciate your response. It's been uh, kind of interesting to see um, just uh, kind of the overwhelming response that we've received, at least from the people that have indicated their interest in the subject. I, I looked at, and of course, with these events, you never have the number of people uh, joined that uh, indicated they would, but just uh, from those that indicated they were interested in it, I saw about 60 global corporations represented, which I think is a very good indicator of where we are. So I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, let's go ahead and kind of hit it in an orderly fashion. Hopefully you see my screen uh, being shared. And what I'll do without spending too much time here is I just wanna set up some very basic ground rules. Um, most of you guys have your cameras on. I appreciate that. Um, if you can at all turn your camera on, I would really appreciate it. It's nice for me to see uh, you as uh, you and I both know that uh, nonverbal communication is really helpful as I can kind of see how the message is being received and I can uh, read the, the cues. I did have a question about uh, recording the session and I'm glad that that was reminded. I am actually going to um, record the session here. So give me one second, I'll get that going. Um, okay, all right. So, uh, it is being recorded and uh, uh, what I prefer rather than uh, all the individual folks recording the session, I would prefer uh, you just get in touch with me afterwards and I'll share the recording uh, with you accordingly. Uh, so that's the answer to that. Ground rules, uh, share camera. I did, uh, you notice that I have you muted just to uh, kind of uh, to uh, control the interruptions. But what I am going to ask you is I'm hoping that this session is going to be fairly um, interactive, and I'm going to ask you to interact through the chat box, and that's what uh, you see there on the bottom, uh, as well, well as the nonverbal feedback that Zoom makes possible. And so you have your uh, raising hand, you have the your yes, your no, your go slower, go faster, and 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 those types of things that I'm going to ask you. And I'm going to pause at certain points. And I'm going to ask you guys to uh, give me your feedback. And so I'm hoping for this to be interactive, but 
uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, limiting the distractions, I've gone ahead and muted all of you. And that's kind of how we're going to progress. So a little bit about myself. Who am I and what makes me, uh, what gives me the platform, I guess, to uh, lead this session today. I was born in Eastern Europe, Soviet Union to be exact, and educated there in the U.S. Um, I've really been kind of a student of human behavior, if you will, for the past 25 plus years, during which I both underwent and delivered a number of global uh, training sessions around, around the world. And um, as a professionally trained researcher with an RN PhD, I'm also an experienced practitioner. Uh, my professional experience has taken me in way over 100 different uh, oil and gas, as well as data center locations and construction facilities and so on and so forth around the world, um, as well as collaboration and consultation with global teams operating those facilities. I live in Texas with my wife, as you can see on the picture, and our four kids, and, and that's who I am. So why, uh, why are we here and what are we doing here and why has, um, is there a tremendous interest whenever we start talking about this particular subject? The reason for that, obviously, is because um, none of us want to end up in the headlines that you see on the screen in front of you. Um, a lot of these are fairly, um, fairly recent. As, as I, my heart goes out to uh, the most recent one, of course, is the Louisiana uh, vessel capsized. Uh, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard has spent its search, but there are volunteers that are still searching for um, the seven that still remain missing uh, off the coast of Louisiana. And so um, you see uh, the other picture here is you see a, a, a humongous, um, a really significant data center uh, fire that you see on the bottom of the screen there that took place in France. That was a very significant event. And, and, and the list kind of goes on, whether it's an air uh, aviation industry tra um, accident or a uh, construction accident. Uh, these are the types of, uh, these are the types of uh, news that none of us want to make. And that's why um, that's why we're, um, we're we, we, we want to learn a little bit more and see what we can what we can discover as we kind of um, learn and, and join these types of events. Now, I am going to just go ahead and jump on in. I'm not going to beat around the bush a whole lot, but a lot of the organizations that you've either been a part of, or maybe you're a part of right now, or maybe this is the, organiz the, the organizational goal that you're actually driving. You're the key person that's driving this goal. And a lot of us have been a part of organizations where we have had this target zero or some variation of that, some iteration of this goal zero, you know, basically zero injuries, zero, zero incidents. And I think in some ways, you know, this type of goal is very easy to sympathize with. I mean, a truly committed management could hardly appear to settle for anything less, right? But my question, and this is what I'm kind of doing to try to get us going to try to get our thinking going is what happens after you reach it? Is your organization going to declare a decisive victory and then relax and let your guard down? And, and, and so the reason, the things that I'm going to talk about and the issues that I'm going to raise over the next few minutes are, are hopefully prodding your thinking and adding some additional perspective uh, in presenting some of the things, and a lot of things that you probably already know. And, and what I'm suggesting here is that perhaps it's wiser for us to view this rather than as a safety war with a decisive victory where we can kind of let our guard down and relax as an endless guerrilla fight. And certainly high reliability organizations that we all know about and and read about, that's the way they're viewing it. It's an endless guerrilla conflict. And the key to relative success in these high reliability organizations, and in case, I'm sure you've heard about it a lot, but in case you haven't, what is a high reliability organization? Well, there are a lot of factors that make one, but one of the key factors for our conversation that make an organization a high reliability organization is that they have less than their fair share of incidents. And, and, and one, of the, one of the key things that are, that, they, that characterizes uh, high reliability organizations is that they seem to be, they seem to have a abiding concern with failure. Uh, in fact, uh, UPS founder Jim Casey popularized the notion of constructive dissatisfaction. And that certainly is what 
high reliability organizations are characterized by. You know, a question has been raised a long time ago by uh, organizations like Walmart and lots of other global corporations. And, and this is a, a really a question that we're asking. The, the whole idea of sustainability is, is a big thing in the market, no matter what industry you're in, whether you are in oil and gas, whether you're in insurance, whether you're in, in data center or technology industry, sustainability is a big thing. And, but have we asked about our safety paradigm? Is it sustainable? Uh, what is a sustainable safety paradigm? It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic, it's a safer dynamic culture. Uh, it's a culture that knows how to think critically, ascertain new hazards and analyze them within the system's way of thinking paradigm. This culture is constantly adapting to the dynamic environments of our place. I mean, let's be honest, none of our workplaces are static. They're all dynamic environments. And so this culture thinks on its feet and does not require a new safety manual every time there's a new hazard or variability introduced into the work environment. And, and, and speaking of systems thinking, this is kind of where I'm introducing that whole concept. I mean, let's think about it. Each of our facilities and our workplaces are comprised of systems, right? And naturally, when we have an issue that arises in one of these systems, and we look at that issue, we approach the issue not from an individual issue perspective, but from how it impacts the entire system, and we, uh, uh, as well as directing fixes towards this whole system. Examples, our facilities have electrical systems, they have water circulation systems, they have work process systems, they have phone systems, fire suppression systems, HVAC systems, uh, and, and that's just a small list, but when it comes to our error, human error approach, we have historically approached it from a person approach, from a person approach. What's a person approach to human error? Well, a person approach to human error focuses on unsafe acts and errors and procedure violations of frontline personnel. And we basically think that a, uh, the system approach, we basically think that these unsafe acts, the human error, they arise from forgetfulness or from inattention, poor motivation, carelessness, negligence, recklessness. And, and what we do is our whole effort is uh, aimed at reducing unwanted human variability. But the truth is that human factors and human performance, which is the subject that I wanted to talk about a little bit today, where human error is considered, it's also a system. And perhaps it's time for us to have the same systems approach to it as we do to all the other systems in our facilities. And what is a systems approach to human error? Well, a systems approach recognizes that humans are fallible and that errors are to be expected, even the best organizations. In fact, a systems approach recognizes that errors are very often consequences. They're not causes. And errors originate from systemic factors, such as recurrent error traps. So let me give you an idea or an example of recurrent error traps. Paul Fitz was an American Air Force colonel who studied pilot accident records, digging through some 460 different cases of what were labeled as pilot errors back in 1947. He found that a large part of the cases consisted of pilots confusing the flap and gear handles. Typically, a pilot would land and then raise the gear instead of the flap, causing the airplane to collapse onto the ground and leaving it with considerable damage. Fitz examined the hardware in the average cockpit to find that the controls for gear and flaps were often placed right next to each other. They looked the same, they felt the same, and when one was, and which one was on which side of the other was not standardized across different cockpits. And so this is an example of an air trap waiting to happen. In other words, confusing the two handles was not incomprehensible or random, it was systematic, connected clearly to features on the cockpit layout. But maybe the best way that I can introduce the difference between the person approach and the system approach, let me do this for you. Let me do something interesting. 
what if I superimposed this picture on the screen? Now, most of you should recognize what it is. And if you don't, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's Professor James Reason, Swiss cheese model of accident causation is what you have on the screen in front of you. See, our organizations and facilities have many defensive layers in them. We have alarms, we have trained personnel, we have certified personnel, we have procedures, and, and, and all of these, all of these are functioning to protect us from unwanted events. In an ideal world, each of these defense systems, and I and I have labeled them as employee, job, organization, leadership, and so on and so forth, and you can add any kind of labor as you really want. But in an ideal world, each of these defensive layers would be intact. In reality, however, they're more like slices of Swiss cheese, having many holes, though unlike in the cheese, these holes are continually opening, shutting, and shifting their location. The presence of hole in any one slice doesn't normally cause a bad outcome, but a bad outcome comes about when the holes in many layers momentarily line up to permit a trajectory of accident opportunity. The holes in the defenses arise for two reasons, active failures and latent conditions. Nearly all adverse events involve a combination of these two sets of factors. And so if you look at the, at the picture of accident causation, what you see is that a person's approach that we have considered for a long time has focused mainly on one slice, on one defense, and that's just the employee slice. And the systems approach considers all the other, considers employee as well, but also all the other slices, all the other layers as well. And that's kind of what we're talking about. In fact, a systems thinking implication, just to kind of further uh, prod your thinking a little bit more about that, is um, systems are powerful things. In fact, just to kind of prod your, your thinking on this, think about this with me. Last time you went to the grocery store, or think about your local, your favorite grocery store. Where do they have milk positioned in your grocery store? <laughs> I'm going to tell you where. That's right. It's going to be the furthest away from the entry point into the grocery store. Why? Because most people that are going to go just to get a gallon or two of milk, they're going to take you through as many other aisles and parts and grocery departments and so on and so forth, they possibly can. That's a systems way of thinking. They want to get you there and they want you to walk away with a whole lot more than what you just came in for. That's systems way of thinking. Or think about last time you shopped on Amazon. So you go into your, your log into Amazon and you look for your part and immediately, immediately after you find your after you find your item, what does it say right below the item? Usually this is bought together with, right? So there's your first systems way of pushing you to add a couple more things. And then you scroll down the screen and it says, customers who searched for this also looked at, <laughs> that's again, using peer pressure plus uh, a, a, a gentle suggestion recommendation to guide you. And so the reason that systems way of thinking is really, really important is because in addition to just preventing errors, you need to think about the consequences of errors. And you need to think about the fact that a lot of these errors, which we investigate a lot of times when we focus just on the active error that led to the final unwanted event, is it really the fault of that person, that employee, which it may be sometimes, or is it our system that has caused that with all the unwritten, with all the unspoken expectation that has caused that employee to do what they did? In fact, that kind of brings me to the next slide. And that is, historically, we have looked at the behavior-based safety as a kind of way of looking at things. And, and, and it's been interesting to watch as you kind of look at the world of safety the whole idea of human factors and human performance has been slowly coming on the scene and replacing the behavior-based safety. I wouldn't say that it is completely, uh, uh, completely replacing, but I would say that it is incorporating some of the good things, kind of like your iPhone, your new iPhone has probably incorporated some basic telephone technologies from your old circa 1990s or 1980s Motorola uh, cell phone 
Um, it hasn't completely deleted, it has incorporated some of these technologies, but believe me, it's also incorporated a lot of the latest research. And that's what's happening in the world of safety. Uh, from everything that I've done as far as the research that I've done and, and looking at, at where things are, the idea and the subject of human factors, human performance is quickly coming onto the scene and it's gonna stay there. It's gonna dominate our conversations, I would imagine for the next five plus years and perhaps a lot longer than that. Why? Because behavior-based safety has had an overly simplistic understanding of behaviors, okay? It has not really incorporated a whole lot about the fact that people have emotions, people get tired and cranky, and sometimes they just don't feel like it. It, it, it uh, fails to explain behavior-based safety, how workers can fix giant operational problems in real time and still slip on the concrete floor of your plant. The biggest thing that BBS didn't consider is context, and that's what I was talking about, is the systems. It's what all the systems drove the behavior. And it's interesting because I think the behavior-based safety and, and kind of our, 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 um, our historic definition of safety, and you can even look at the Oxford uh, English Dictionary, and it has a really kind of a not sufficient definition of safety, if you think about it, because the current definition of safety that we're operating off is absence of accidents and injuries. It's a non-event. I think it's pro probably time to, for us to start looking at it uh, from a new perspective as far as, as the ability to deal with risks and hazards so as to avoid damage or losses and yet still achieve their goal. That, by the way, by the way is a definition that Professor James Reason um, introduced to us. And so as, as we kind of talk about how we incorporate uh, this whole idea of human factors, human performance, um, I was uh, talking to a friend that uh, uh, works in the risk management department of a large um, multinational Australian company called BHP. And we were talking about this whole idea of how BHP is globally incorporating uh, human factors and human performance principles. And what he was telling me is that they have this um, comprehensive plan of embedding these thoughts and these principles into every way of thinking, into their accident investigation, into their work process, into their work planning, which is really an awesome way of doing that. But if you, um, and, and what I asked him a question is, but have you introduced some of these concepts as sort of as an initial introduction to your employees? And so that's kind of what prompted this conversation. I think probably one of the ways that we incorporate this is stage one to use Elon Musk's Falcon uh, 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 spaceship here is you have to have kind of a, an initial introduction. In the stage two, you have to embed these principles into, uh, into all of your different systems and ways of doing things. And in fact, I wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about um, a, a training that as a result of the, the research that I've done, um, I wanted to let you know of the availability of this training that just does that initial first stage and that's human factors for critical environments. It's sort of a combination of uh, human performance and human factors, which, by the way, if you do research, Todd Conklin, um, James Reason, lots of other guys that have talked about Sidney Decker, um, and the conversation kind of goes on, uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, there was really no right or wrong reason to do human factors and human performance. It's a, it's a philosophical shift in thinking. And so my uh, version of it that I just wanted to let you know that it's available out there, it's a two-day introductory course. And what it does is it base, it focuses on perspective. It's a change of perspective, introduction of a different perspective. And it gives a big picture for the C-suite executive leadership. And it also introduces a new way of thinking for frontline. And that's kind of the big idea. What I wanted to do today with you guys and what I, as well as what my training does is, is, is it's prompting thinking, not necessarily providing right answers, not necessarily providing everything you need to know, but just prompting thinking. Because that's really what we want, right? I mean, end result is a safety culture. And a safety culture is not a strict, blind, mindless adherence to a bunch of rules, but it's mindfulness. It's one of the other concepts that you're going to be seeing coming on a lot more as time goes on. It provides practical tools and tips for both and kind of paves the way for that stage two systemic buy-in, systemic embedding. So I just wanted to let you know that that's out there. Now, Let's talk about this a little bit more to the systemic way of thinking things. You see, most of our organizations that are out there, the global leaders, whether it's oil and gas, it's data centers and 
by the way, uh, having had interaction with some of the global leaders in both of those industries, including the top five uh, technology companies. I mean, we're talking about your uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, having had a lot of inter interactions, personal interactions, as well as um, just uh, hands-on experiences in a lot of their facilities. What I've realized is even if you're one of these top five, you what you do really well is your technical stuff. You're rigging up, rigging down, your cable installation, your server repair, you got that down. But, it, but here's the question. What about the non-technical stuff? You know, what about the communication, the decision-making, the situational awareness, the teamwork? Incidentally, back in the 70s already, the airline industry realized that most of their accidents all the way back in the 70s had to do with the non-technical stuff. It wasn't maintenance problems. It wasn't their technical issues or technical expertise. It was the non-technical items and the picture that you see on top of your screen the the uh, bp incident uh, obviously in 2011 in the gulf of, in in the uh, Mex gulf of mexico if you look at the official investigation of that 150 plus billion dollar accident what you're going to find is three out of the top five reasons top five root causes that led to this event had to do with the non-technical so my question is in your organization right now where you are who ensures the employees got that down. The employees know how to incorporate their physical, their technical knowledge into these non-technical environments. Is it your HR? Is it your HSE? And, and that's what the human factors, the human performance systems way of thinking helps. That's one of the gaps that it helps you to bridge. So here's a question for you. Let's do a little interaction, right? Uh, use, you can use, either use your chat or use your uh, nonverbal feedback options available to you right there in, um, in Zoom. And help me out with this. In an emergency, strict compliance with emergency protocols can mean the difference between life and death. Do you agree with that? Would you agree with that? Would you agree with this statement? In an emergency, Strict compliance with emergency protocols can mean the difference between life and death. I'm, so I have one yes. I have, okay, somebody uh, using nonverbal. I got a check mark, excellent. Any, anyone else? Anyone else? I mean, I, I would say that generally, and I'm seeing some other of you guys are, are saying yes, so I appreciate that. Um, I would say that generally that's a pretty true statement, but you know what's interesting? And by the way, the picture in the middle, that's a, a called a Penrose triangle. It's a, it's a symbol that I've chosen for safety paradoxes. So, but what about this? Did you know that on Piper Alpha, one of the uh, significant um, uh, events that happened back in the 80s, in the late 80s in the North Sea, most of the 165 deceased workers complied strictly with the safety drills and assembled in the accommodation area. Did you also know that the few fighter, firefighters that survived the Mangal forest fire disaster in 1949 actually did that by dropping their heavy tools and rain and running while those who died obeyed the organizational instruction to keep their firefighting tools with them at all times. Why am I, thank you, William, I see that, that comment. I, I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. Why am I bringing that up because what we're trying to do in the systems way of thinking is it allows our employees uh, and in fact the high reliability organizations that have been using the systems way of thinking for a while now as far as in the world of human error what they're doing is they're uh, they're they're actually viewing the human variability which a system approach or a person approach to safety has not really appreciated and they viewed it their problem high reliability organizations are actually view that as one of their biggest assets Human variability, var variability is one of the biggest assets because it allows the humans dynamically with the big picture in mind, be able to adjust their actions in accordance with the present situation. So give me your thoughts here. Uh, here's another question for you. The best way to improve my organization's safety. Um, give me an A or a B through your chat box if you can. A or B, the best way to improve my organization's safety is by decreasing risk or increasing competency and enhanced capacity for risk. What do you think?
Okay, got a B. B, okay. Like that. Anyone else? All right, B, okay. All right, some more Bs, all right. Good, good, good. I, I, I like that because that is exactly kind of where we're going with this is that, uh, and that takes us actually to the next slide is um, one of the things that kind of uh, just giving you a little bit of, uh, of understanding, a little bit of an overview, and I'm sure that you're familiar with that, but what is human factors? At least again, like I said, this is, uh, this is the way that I've organized it. There are uh, lots of other ways of doing that. Um, but the way I think a, a good comprehensive, fairly simple way of understanding human factor is it's a discipline that studies the relationship. And you see these three circles, the individual, the job, and the organization. And they're, they're really, they're very interconnected. There's really hard, very difficult to know where one starts and, and the other ends. And, but, but all three have effects on behaviors, abilities, limitations, and performance. And incidentally, as you start researching, and I think I've already mentioned that, the whole idea of human factors and human performance, one of the things you're finding is that these high reliability organizations, your aviation industry, you find that your nuclear uh, electricity production industry, um, these industries have incorporated these factors or these principles into their operations for a long time. In fact, uh, you see the three branches of the U.S. military, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army have incorporated human factors, principles, and training. And that is one of the secrets for their success. It's interesting because in my background, whether it's been um, uh, energy industry or technology industry, we've always sort of looked up to the, especially U.S. nuclear Navy. They have been able to operate critical environments for decades now without any significant events. And so everybody always wants to know, how do they do it? And aside from, of course, having a complete and total control of, of their personnel and uh, controlling their schedules, their diets, and so on and so forth, one of the other ways that they do that, which of course most of our employers cannot do, but one of the other ways that we've discovered is their incorporation of human factors. Perhaps that is one of the secrets, I believe that it is, to their success. So let's look just to take a little bit of a deeper dive, if you don't mind, over the next few minutes. And by the way, I'm going to leave um, some time at the end for some question and answer and some interaction. Um, but for right now, and, and I'll un unmute you guys uh, in just a few moments. But for right now, let's look at take a deeper dive into individual. Humans are fallible. Um, that's the system's way of looking at individual. Okay. So if humans are fallible, then error is normal, right? Even your, I mean, shoot, let's, before we go any further, let's be honest. Um, today, how many of us have already made an error? It may not have been significant error. It may not have been a huge thing, but I guarantee you that of all of us in this, in this room right now, a number of us probably have already done something that we're like, oh man, that was, that was not right. And so this approach uh, to the individual in that error is normal will help us realize that even the best, even our best workers will make mistakes on their best days. Error is expected instead of surprise that. And so instead of trying to figure out how we can perfect the imperfect human beings, what we're looking at is how to improve our organizational resilience in the face of errors and how to prove instead of just how to try to prevent errors. Error without operational or physical consequences tell us where our systems are robust and functioning and where errors and mistakes are possible. Uh, Todd Conklin said this, and I think it's so true. If you design and create a process that demands perfection from an imperfect and normal human operator, any design process fails because of an operator error or mistake, this failure is the product of the system design and not of the human operator. Isn't that true? And that's what this, that, that's what a human factors, human, human performance systems way of thinking. And in fact, as we kind of think about this, we realize that errors are never choices. In our organization, do you punish honest mistakes? What are honest mistakes? And another question is, how many of your employees plan 
on making dishonest mistakes. I'm going to tell you something. Short of a few people that are purposefully trying to uh, to uh, really do something evil and something terrible, most of our employees that show up to our workplaces do not show up with an intent of doing something bad, with an intent of making a mistake, with an intent of making an error. And as Todd Conklin puts it, you know, a lot of times when you're when when you're doing something wrong, right up until the time that you have an actual uh, negative impact, negative event, do, wh whatever you're doing, it felt exactly like how it felt when you were doing it right. And so that's the way that we're looking at that. And, and, and so and here's the thing. When we look at humans as fallible, then when we investigate events, undesirable events, let's make sure that we spend equal time considering both the human failures and the poorly designed system that allowed an incident to become an injury outage. A lot of the root cause analysis can be quite damaging if they're not done right. Right, Bobby? That's why it's so important to do it the right way. Also, when we collect, and, and here's, here's a, um, and I agree with you, Larry, not being able to perfect humans does not mean we can't improve them significantly. Absolutely, absolutely. And but what I'm saying here um, is that rather than focusing all of our energies on just improving individuals, we need to focus equal amount of energies on improving the systems that are inadvertently causing these individuals to do what they're doing. And that's, that's the point that I'm making here. You know, the other really, really, I think, good practical illustration out of that is when we collect near miss and close call or near hit or whatever your organization calls these reports. And it's and by the way, this this brings me to another point, uh, organizational reporting. That's where you see when I was talking earlier about not completely throwing away the behavior based safety, because one of the things that behavior based safety brought to us is this idea of, of observations and reporting. And I think observational reporting is really, really important you're collecting a lot of really valuable data. And when you're collecting these near hit reports, near miss reports, let's consider not only what could have happened, but what actually did happen and how the event stayed in the almost category and what kept it from crossing over into the injury or incident category. Were we just good and lucky? Or are our systems robust enough to be able to prevent this from happening? In fact, according to um, Todd Conklin, a good near miss is the most aggressive and effective test your organization could ever undertake to prove that your safety systems are robust, effective, and valuable. And, and so the next thing that we look at a lot of times is this whole idea of back brain and front brain. You know, psychologists have been intensely interested for several decades now in the two modes of thinking with the human brain and have offered many labels for them. Some call it back brain, front brain, fast brain, slow brain, system one, system two. But basically your back brain operates automatically and quickly. If you're in the same room with me, and I don't know if you're gonna hear this, and I, and I slammed the table. I don't know if you heard that. Hopefully it wasn't too loud for you. I apologize if it was. But if you're in the same room with me and I slammed the table, what I see when I conduct this training, what I see a lot of times is people immediately go, you know, you turn, that's an automatic, that's a system two, that's a, or system one, that's a fast brain, that's a back brain reaction. And it operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort. Uh, you know, another example of uh, back brain or a type of activity is, you know, you complete the sentence, bread and, in fact, you know what, I'm gonna unmute you guys so you can unmute yourself and participate as you want. Give me one second, let me see if I can do that. Um, okay. Well, I think you can unmute yourselves. I just did. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yeah, you you guys feel free to unmute yourselves so you can kind of participate if you want. Thanks, Bobby. I appreciate it. it you know, you answer two plus two equals. I mean, these are ex other examples of, of, a, of a fast brain. And, and why am I talking about it here? without spending too much time. When you have employees in your, in your organizations that have been there seven plus years, they're somewhat of an expert in what they do. They operate the same exact environment. They do the exact same things. They're, a lot of their operations, a lot of their things almost go into this auto mode. 
this autopilot. And let me tell you something, when you are sending a team to perform critical operations, and this is what high reliability organizations understand, is no, there's no such thing as a routine operation. Our, our environments are dynamic. Our, our equipment is dynamic. It is constantly in a state of ter- deterioration. Our facilities are dynamic. And even ourselves as humans, you know, how I'm going to think today is going to depend on what I ate two hours later. It's going to depend on whether I'm in pre-lunch sugar low. It's going to depend on whether I got enough of sleep or whether my mind is occupied with the marital issues that I have at home. And so that's why you want to ensure that your employees, when they're performing critical operations, they're actually using the front brain, the slow brain. This is the, 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 this is the area that sort of allocates your slow, your effortful mental activities. If I asked you right now, what is your phone number? That's when you're actually engaging your slow brain. You're like, oh, phone number. And I'm having to kind of recall that. Um, or I asked you for your uh, spouse's phone number, the same kind of a thing. Um, when you have to maintain a faster walking speed than what's natural for you, you're engaging your slow brain. And But you know what's interesting? Even in the slow brain, and because a lot of times what we've done historically is we've told our employees, but when you're about to do a critical task, you just need to stop and think. My question is, is stopping and thinking always going to prevent possible human error? That's back to what you were saying, Larry. This is We're, we're dealing here with, with some specific ideas and specific pointers for how we can significantly improve uh, and decrease the possibility of human errors. And so what the psychologists are telling us is that there are actually quite a few, a number of, uh, a number of um, limits to even this stopping and thinking. These are, these are areas where even our stopping and thinking, even our engaging slow brain can still produce an error, can still result in an error. Overconfidence. We're a lot more confident than, than we realize we are. Memory limitations. In fact, I want to I do something for you just over a second. Give you an example of a memory limitation. Hopefully, you have a paper and a pen in front of you. If you don't, see if you can grab one. Um, I'm going to go to the next screen. I'm going to leave the picture on the next screen for five seconds. And after five seconds, I'll take the picture off. And I want you to reproduce what you see in the middle of the screen. The picture that you see in the middle of the screen, I just want you to reproduce it the best you can based on what you saw. Okay? You ready? Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So see if you can take about... 10, 15 seconds, see if you can reproduce reproduce that the best you can. And uh, hold hold your pictures when you did to the screen. I wanna see, I wanna see what you got. I don't know if you can see it. Larry, I, 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 hold it up for one more second. I almost saw it. Larry. Oh, I love Paris. I see, I see Jim, hold yours up. Huh? I love Paris in the springtime in a triangle. All right. All right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. I see yours, Bobby. William, thank you. Appreciate it, Chris. All right. All right. Good. Now, let's do a little exercise. Are you ready? So this is a memory limitation. So I want you to look at your triangles, and I want you to look at the picture, and I want you to compare, and tell me if you got it exactly right. Do you have two V's on your picture? Do you have two V's in your paper? Nope, missed that one. Yeah. I love Paris in the V springtime. Is that what you got? No, I missed that. So here's a perfect (laughs) illustration. Here's a perfect illustration of a limit of this stop and think. What your brain just did is it actually quietly corrected to the norm, to what it is familiar with and to what it thought was gonna be there. And so that's a perfect illustration. I'm gonna give you another one, another test. And in fact, what I'm gonna do right now is over the next 10 seconds, I am going to induce a incorrect memory, a false memory. I'm going to predict that in the next 10 seconds, number of you are going to evidence a false memory. Are you ready? So here's how we do it. It's very simple. I'm going to give you a list of items. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you through this list. So listen carefully. Ready? Candy, sour, 
sugar, bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. Now, I could give you a free memory recall where I can just ask you to give me at least 10 of the words that I've done, but I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a recognition test, okay? And a recognition test is gonna work like that. I'm gonna ask you for a word. If you remember this word being on the list and I'm gonna ask you to hold your hands or uh, uh, use the chat box, whichever way you want, and let me know if this was on the list. So here's the first one, you ready? Taste. Was taste on the list of words that you just heard? Yes or no? Taste. Was taste on it? Okay, I see a couple of hands. I see one no. no. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, all right. So uh, you sure the taste was on it? No. Some say no, some say okay. Okay. Well, actually, uh, taste was on it. Oh, so no. those of you guys that said uh, the taste was on it, you remembered it correctly. Very good. What about the word point? Was point on it? Yes? No. no? No. No. Lots of no's. You sure the point was not on it? Okay. You're right. You're right. Very good. You guys are doing well. Hey, point was not on it. That was not one of the words. Next one. What about sweet? Was sweet on it? Sweet? Yes. 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 Yeah? Maybe. Okay. So I've got, are you sure that sweet was on it? I think so. Okay. Remember the majority of you are telling me that sweet was on it. And sweet was actually not on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> power, sugar, bitter, good taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. Sweet. Now, the reason you thought that sweet was on it is because a lot of the words sounded sweet. Pie, soda, chocolate, cake, okay? And I've even told you, I just warned you a minute ago that I was going to induce a false memory. I warned you about it. I didn't just spring it on you, and I did. I succeeded. And so... All of this is to say, just to kind of start illustrating the limitations of human mind and our own limitations and how important it is for us and for our employees. When we show up to the critical environments, when we show up in front of the critical tasks, for us to be aware of this, these limitations, and, and, and for us to uh, take it with a dose of, of uh, uh, right perspective, uh, you know, when we follow the the uh, SOPs, and a lot of times there's a tendency to kind of go through two or three steps at a time and then sign off, because I'm going to remember what I did. Are you? So that's just a, just a, just an illustration of that there. So here's another question for you, real quickly. In my organization, safety is viewed as a normal function of operations or successful reduction of risk. You may be thinking, what in the world kind of a question is that? But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Okay, so I've got some A's, I've got some B's, a normal function of operations, successful reduction of risk. And I'm sure uh, some of you guys are um, probably unsure a little bit on that. And, uh, but really what high reliability organizations are showing and what the systems approach, human factors, human performance approach to uh, safety is that safety is not something that will leave off to the professionals. Safety is not something that it should only be the, a function of a safety department or a safety guy somewhere out there, you know, corporate guy that never uh, leaves the office and always sits in there and tells us all the difficult things that we have to do and makes our operations really hard. Actually, the safety culture, the quickest way to a safety culture, to a true safety culture, is when each and every one in the organization views himself or herself as her brother's or her sister's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. Safety is my responsibility as much as it is the responsibility of the next guy. So a couple of practical illustrations and I'll, and I'll uh, cut off here and we can kind of uh, take some questions and talk a little bit more about it uh, or, or, or discuss any areas that you kind of want to look at. But uh, practical things. Um, the COVID pandemic that we've all been experiencing over the last year, so it seems like 10 years, but... Um, According to the dentist, it is producing a, an epidemic of jaw pain, broken teeth and clenched jaws. And why do you think that is? Stress. 
<laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it is. Incredible amounts of, and I've seen that in my house. And I know that you have seen it in yours. And stress is a really interesting thing if you think about it. You know, as humans, we were designed with what you may have heard as a fight or flight mechanism. The response from our bodies is one of the most basic instincts, and it's hardwired into our brains, designed to prepare our bodies to save us in times of crises. Historically, our predecessors relied on this mechanism for when they were in danger, for example, when facing a predator or other physical danger. When our brain recognizes we are in danger, our sympathetic nervous system prepares our body to stay and fight or to run away. The physical response from our body can be quite dramatic, including massive release of hormones, chemical messengers released into our blood that tell organs and muscles to take various actions and result changes to our body's behavior. You know, what's interesting, though, in today's complex society, threats perceived by our brain that result in a fight or flight mechanism are mostly non-physical. They may be in a home or workplace or elsewhere. Our body, though, responds in the exact same way. But because the threat could be an argument at home, we do not direct the huge resources provided by the fight or flight mechanism into a physical reaction. And so, what's what? And, and so, if our employees understand that, then they understand how to deal with all of these changes that still happen in the body when you're stressed. What does it do to your thinking ability? Scientists tell us that stress shrinks brain networks, and when your brain networks are shrunk, usually you have this understanding that your time element is very shrunk. You don't have the time to make decisions and your obvious or available options for decision making also shrink drastically. So just for our, built, for our employees to understand these implications help them to prepare and to know what to do and what resources to go to when they feel like they're stressed. Here's another practical implication of the system's way of thinking. What, what about the aging workforce? I'm sure you're aware that between 2011 and 2030, 10,000 U.S. baby boomers turn 65 every day. It creates an incredible talent gap, but it also creates a lot of other gaps. It creates communication gap, leadership gap. It creates the, 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 the millennials coming and making up as of 2020, 50% of the American workforce. And so how do we deal with that? Does it create significant air preconditions if there are not right communication and leadership principles and understanding as far as that is concerned. What about chronic health conditions? You may be saying, well, there are HIPAA requirements and you're right, there are. But as a good leader, you should know if you're sending employee A to go into the critical and perform your critical task today, does this employee happen to suffer from diabetes and is he actually currently on a sugar low right now? And are you sending, you're setting them up for failure. So this is really important for us to know and to understand. But what about masks and the, the incredible, uh, incredible issue that, these, uh, that this new requirement has introduced to our nonverbal communication? You know, scientists tell us that 90% of our communication is derived nonverbally. And we look at things like tone and pace and pitch and eye movement and pupil dilation. How in the world with a mask would you be able to tell that, on, that on, on the right, the guy is actually really angry and disgusted. And on the left, he's actually really scared and he's, he, he's portraying that with his nonverbal communication. So it's really important for our employees to know, or how are you gonna know as a leader when you're asking uh, one of your supervisors or you're asking one of your line employees a question, just by looking at them, how are you gonna know whether their answer is truthful or not? Just through the nonverbal communications, are they going to look? Uh, are they're they're going to look up into the left, engaging the creative uh, parts of their brain. Those are the things that are really important for us to know. Just as far as um, and and there are other there are wearables. There, there are lots of other really interesting practical implications that that is important for us to know when we look at that new perspective. But I really won't spend a whole lot more time uh, on that. Is this kind of stuff common sense? Uh, it's not really common sense because if it was common, everybody would be talking about it and everybody would, be, would know about it, but it's definitely very sensible. The things that we're talking about, they're sensible things. So any questions, any, any other thoughts, any, any other uh, comments or questions that you guys have? I know I didn't leave uh, enough time, but I, I'd like to take some time for this. Well, um, the, the, the question I've got is uh, what, what do you do when, you 
can't improve the system. So you've, you've got a stairway, you've got a fire door, you can't design it so that you can't pinch your fingers in the fire door. It's hard to design a stairway where you can't fall down it. Sure. And although it's a pleasing philosophy to say that uh, the employee, um, uh, you know, is, is making mistakes because the system is, uh, you know, prone, prone, you know, creating error and so on. What do you, like, you know, like I've, I've seen thousands of investigation reports where people have slipped and fallen on stairways or even on the same level surface. And it's like they're looking for, like, you know, they're praying that there's a hazard or something to fix, a crack in the pavement or something. Right. Because if the person just tripped on their own two feet, and there's a reason that there's an expression right. like that, because it happens. Sure. What do you do about it for that last column where it says action taken to prevent recurrence? Right. And at this stage, I realize that the human error, the, the loss of balance caused a fall and an injury. But how many times, as I put it in the chat line, how many times a week do you lose your balance? And how many times was it caused by the system right. versus you were rushing or you were tired or you were frustrated or whatever sure. it was? Sure. And so that's a, and that's you, a very what do, you, what do you like when when the, you start looking at the that volume of those kinds of recordables at companies? Where does your solution, your system solution, take over? Like. You know, do you then say we're going to replace them all with elevators? Right. No, that's a very good question. That's a, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, if 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 I didn't make some of these things clear, then it's clearly the responsibility is on me. But I think what I'm trying to communicate here, rather than saying that, and I hope I didn't come across to say that none of the human errors are attributable to the actual action of individual, because I didn't mean to say that. But what I did mean to say is, even using your example of losing your balance, you know, how many times is losing your balance is just like you mentioned is due to uh, you being tired, you being distracted, and so on and so forth. And a systems approach to that is going to not just look on fixing the individual and saying, hey, don't get distracted, you know, put your cell phone down. A systems approach is going to look at other ways, not only at the ways to assign the responsibility to the system, but also at the ways to improve the system and make this particular event a non-event or make it to where it's not a fall next time? Is there a way to decrease the distractions? Is there a way to um, a, in, increase the employee's understanding of things that could lead to that? You know, the, as far as the, the good diet, the sufficient rest, the wellness, the well-being, those kinds of things. And so I, I think as a, the system's approach to it is not so much the approach that says, oh, everything is the responsibility of my company or the system. But I think more than anything, it's not just stopping at the employee. And a lot of our investigations historically have just stopped at human error. And what the systems approach says, you know what, human error, if that's, if, if humans are fallible, then human error doesn't give us enough information to be able to prevent. Because frankly, how many of us are ever going to be able to fully stop human error? And well, I think that's what I'm that's what well, the, the question I, I usually ask people is, I said, do your children know what be careful means? Where did they learn it? Right. Right. Like we've, we don't say be careful in incident investigations because we know it's useless. Exactly. And yet every one of our children knows the meaning of be careful because we taught it to them. Yeah. Yeah. So explain that differential to me then. Like how... How is it that we give our workers different advice than we give our children? Well, and it's not just, but here's the thing. I mean, we could talk, we could take that issue, you know, for a while. And by the way, I know that I am uh, out of time. My phone number and email address are on the screen. So if you would like to contact me and ask me uh, or con converse more about this, I'd be happy to talk to you. If you want to talk about our sure. training, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'll answer, I'll stay and answer Larry's question, but you're welcome to do what you need to do as our time 
to respect your time as our time is uh, ending here. Larry, I think, you know, there are so many other things that, that go into that question because a lot of our kids, even in, 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 you know, teaching our kids to be careful, you know, I know with my children, they're going to be careful exactly like I'm careful. And that's another way, another perfect example for the systems approach. You know, I mean, I've worked for corporations that had lots of really great explicit rules and regulations and policies and so on. But the, the subculture, when you actually become part of the team, uh, you know, there are all kinds of different implicit expectations that are placed upon you that you're going to, if you want to be a team player, if you will, you're going to understand that. And so, you know, there are, there are just uh, lots of other issues that are, I think, part of that. And, and so, you know, um, providing generic instructions like be careful to our employees, uh, you know, may... Uh, it may actually accomplish quite the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. If implicitly there are all kinds of other expectations that are placed. I think, I think, I mean, I've, if I can ahead. interject something, I, I think another, another part to answer Larry is that when, when you have kids and the kids are growing up and you're telling them to be careful, uh, you also put a lot of buffers between them and the things they need to be careful about. For instance, we put those little, plastic plugs in the outlets for electricity. Exactly. Uh, we, we, uh, we constantly have right. supervision. Whereas when we get, when we get into a complicated world where, uh, where, where, you know, something can jump up and bite you and kill you in an instant, um, there, they have to be yeah. understand what careful yeah. means by the same, by the same, uh, uh, pattern. And what can we do? You sure. know, the Swiss cheese model being one example, yeah. Uh, what can we do to, to put those barriers in place just like the plug? But now we're talking about a grown adult who has his own mind, free will, all the rest of it. All right. So can we engineer some of that stuff out? You know, right. why was why was the employee tired? Why was the employee rushing? Is that a system thing or is that, that a personal thing? Right. So, there, I mean, there's a lot of other things. And, you know, I mean, I love Larry's program. I, I've got some companies that use his program. Uh, and... Uh, and, and I think if, if we stop at a program, uh, we die. Right. And we've got to, we got to look at all, all the different. We've got to look at that's, that. And that's exactly what I'm proposing. I appreciate that, uh, William. That's a very good point. Uh, that's Larry. I'm not, you know, I'm not arguing for or against any one specific program. I guess what I'm saying is we have to have a comprehensive approach to kind of look at everything that we can do rather than, focusing on any one area and beating that area, you know, until you beat it into the ground. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm proposing. Well, I, I you know, and I, I agree with you too, that, uh, you know, there's, uh, although it was primarily the pundits who said that behavior-based safety was never integrating anything into the system. Anybody that was providing behavior-based safety training in the nineties was advocating that they take the learnings and build it into the system whether the company did it or not is right. always questionable, but sure. it isn't because nobody told them to do it. But the the pundits seized on it, and uh, and and you know, like they're you know they're trying to make a living. They're competitive. Sure. I mean, that's part of the deal, right? You're not going to say your competitors have got a great right. process if you've got a different one. Right. Um, but the reality is that that wasn't true. They were being told to integrate it, but right. they didn't all do it. I mean. You know, quite often they didn't even bother going to talk to anybody when they sure. made an observation. They just sure. filled out an observation card. And I used to tell people, I'd say, if you could improve people yeah. just by looking at them, what right. would your spouse look like now? <laughs> by the way, the, the, the correct answer is exactly the same, gentlemen, if you are ever asked. Like, do not. <laughs> and don't ask her, don't ask her the same question. Sounds probably like say, it was you learn it by experience, Larry. Yeah, she'll probably say, I, I'd like somebody like Sean Connery and Thunderball instead of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyhow, thank thank you very much, though. Yeah. I really appreciate the, the webinar. You guys didn't mean to. Sort no, 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 absolutely. And, and I hope, you know, to your point as well, that I think that my attempt was to be fair. And, and that's what I try to do. I at no point did I intend to say and I hope I didn't make it uh, so to where I think that everything about human behavior based safety was bad. And I did not say that it's time to replace everything about it. I think what I am saying is that there has been some new information on the scene. And it's, 
it's it's okay to incorporate some new research into there you go. As well, well no, I, 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 and if, I, and I, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna teach competency as being one of the elements by definition you're teaching right. behavior based safety right you're incorporating it in sure. one of the problems sure. that that I think we've had in a lot of different realms, for instance, with stop work authority, we tell you it's it's your responsibility, it's your right. right, we'll protect you. The only thing we never teach people to do is how to do it. Right. Because it's an interpersonal, it's a it's it's a reaction between two people. That's right. psychology. And we don't teach our workers how to do the stop right. work. We teach them right. that they have to do it. And right. take that and exaggerate out or, sure. or extrapolate out to a bunch of other sure. things. Sure. And, well, and, yeah. and Go ahead, Larry. No, I was just going to say the part that you brought up, I think that's really key that the supervisors and managers need to understand, and a part you brought in from, from Daniel Kahneman, is that the complacency is a natural function. It's not a character flaw, right? right? In other words, exactly. but I've, I've, I've listened to so many managers who say, you know, how could the guy get complacent with 13,800 volts? And I'm saying, same way you got complacent driving yep. 60 miles an hour. Yeah. It just happened. It, yep. It's not something you can stop yeah. from happening, yeah. but yeah. you can compensate for it a lot on the personal and right. on the system basis. Sure. sure. But I, I certainly agree with the, you know, like if, you know, stop and think before you do something yeah. requires at least a mental checklist. <laughs> exactly. As opposed to, okay, you know, I stopped and thought for a second. Yeah. And I just did it the same way I was going to do it all the rest of the ways. You know, right. that that's not going to get us anywhere. So that that part, I think it's essential that we get out to yeah. we get out to the people that, you know, you can beat complacency, but not by telling people don't get complacent. Right. Right. Yeah, no, you're exactly. absolutely right. And, and, and the beauty of it, just like you mentioned, you know, what Daniel Kahneman helped me to see and, and a lot of these other processes that I've kind of looked at is that you're right. You're absolutely right. I think it's important for our employees to understand that this whole idea of complacency, your brain is designed to constantly take shortcuts, make shortcuts. That's what your brain is constantly it's, doing. It's, it's designed to go to screensavers exactly. so you save it, glucose. Exactly. In yeah. order to preserve yeah. energy. And so your yeah. brain is constantly going to try to preserve energy. And so just being aware that that's something that's a, it's a constant uphill battle that you struggle with. That's why I think some of these concepts are so important, because just for me to understand that and what I've seen actually from conducting this training kind of around the globe, what, what I've seen is I've seen people actually having this aha, this light bulb moment. And they're like, you know what, I'm going to take some time off because I've just realized that I am so overwhelmed in all these areas in my life to where if I take the next three days off, I might have prevented, you know, we might have prevented an error precondition right there as far as someone being way overstressed and making, you know, causing a significant event or an outage or an injury somewhere. And so that's, I think, one of the important things. This well, that, would be, that would be utopia. I mean, right now in Canada, the poor people who are sick don't even get paid if they stay home. So they're going into work sick and getting everybody else sick, you know, so right. to be able to get people to think, you know, I'm getting a little overstressed, I should take three days off work, to be that self aware would be, a, you know, and accommodated by the workplace. And right. The system. And well, obviously, that works in, in, in specific unique situations, and it may not more may not work at others. But that's kind of, you know, the ideal what you want to do is kind of that whole James reason approach to, you know, to air precondition is if you can close these gaps in a number of different layers, then you're that much better off as far as- Well, ask, ask reason what starts the arrow in the first place sometime. It's not just a given. The arrow right. doesn't just exist. Right. Something unexpected has to happen to start that arrow. And he doesn't have much about that whole bit at all because that's how everybody makes personal risk assessments. I mean, I could do exactly what you do. You just finish this sentence. Right. It'll be all right as long as nothing goes wrong. Right. It'll be all right as long as we don't make any mistakes. Right. Sure. And it'll be all right as long as we're all careful. But so that's I think exactly the way people make personal risk right. assessments. They sure. don't make it on the specific control measures and whether right. the potential deficiencies in the specific control measures line up. Right on a personal basis, it's like, can I make it there in this weather or sure. not? 
Sure. I think I can. I'm going to drive. Other people go, no, nah, I think it's too bad. I'm right. Gonna wait. Right. And I think if I understand what reason is saying there is that, you know, what gets the air going, if you will, the air is always going to be going and that's the latent conditions. You know, you're always going to, I mean, none of our organizations are free of latent conditions. You know, they're constantly, you know, it may be a college, recent college grad manager that's writing your procedures that's never been on the field. And that's an error precondition. That's a latent error right there. You know, and you have all kinds of different things. It may be using your analogy, you know, that my tire is underinflated. And so that's going to be a latent condition that I may not have realized if I didn't do a 360 prior to, you know, getting into the car. And so to me, the, the, there's no such thing as getting the air going. The reason the you didn't do the 360 isn't because you didn't know it. It's because you're in a rush and you're complacent. Yeah. Well, yeah. why else wouldn't yeah. you do it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you've got to get before the air, you've got to get to the human factors that are causing exactly the error. And yeah. then you can actually look at those errors. They're actually, I mean, the states are actually quite predictable. Like if I asked you, when are you likely going to be tired today? You can probably tell me within five minutes. Sure. sure. But will you do anything proactively about it at three o'clock right. in the afternoon or not? Or will you just fight through it? Right. is the part that's been missing, I find. Right, right. Anyhow, you guys, um, thank you very much for the- Absolutely, thanks for joining, I appreciate it. And thank you everybody else. Any other questions before I go? I know I've kept you here about 11 minutes too long, but any last minute questions from anyone else? No, good yeah. stuff, I appreciate you. No, All right, well, I appreciate you, you joining you again. My inf information is uh, provided there on the screen. I uh, would love to uh, hear back from you guys if anyone else is interested in anything else and you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, appreciate it. You bet, take care. Hey, Simon, you still there? Yes. Hey, uh, that was me that was uh, asking about recording the session a while ago. Yeah, I saw that, Justin. And I've recorded it, and I'll give you a copy. I think you were asking for James, right? Yeah, James Junkin. Absolutely. Yeah, That's yeah, my yeah. mental